Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains just nuts. Insane, actually. And today, we are going to discuss a few ideas that were that exact thing. In fact, they were so crazy that they just weren't built at all. And honestly, kind of disappointed that we never got to see a physical version of a lot of these, but it happens. These are five insane train concepts that were never built. The Quintuplex. Oh yeah, we're already starting big. Go big or go home. It's the Quintuplex. Now I'm well aware that recently we discussed the fact that Union Pacific actually drew up plans for a Hexaplex, and that's even more insane. But the Quintuplex was actually patented in June of 1914 by George R. Henderson. It was included in a patent for a quadruplex locomotive four sets of driving wheels, but the quintuplex was also there, and it was a 288882 under the white notation. The sheer insanity of even attempting to build anything beyond a triplex, which I've already mentioned previously were not considered successful at all, is pretty nutty, if we're being honest. But one of the nice things about George R. Henderson's patent is that it did incorporate two boilers. Realizing that a single boiler was absolutely, absolutely not going to be enough, according to the patent, this was a compound locomotive. Engine cylinders 7 and 9 would receive high pressure steam to drive the first and third sets of wheels, and the exhaust as lower pressure steam from cylinders 8 and 10 would be used to power the second and fourth sets of wheels. An interesting thought process, as well as the idea that the engineer's cab was actually at the front of the vehicle, is this would be way too long to put it at the back. The fireman's cab was behind the firebox, so the crew was separated like with a camelback locomotive. So I don't really consider that great in terms of safety, but you know, that was kind of the way it had to be. He actually proposed a communication system between the cabs that would use cables or rod-operated signaling devices. Kind of like the engine-ordered telegraph that was used on steamships. Or maybe even a voice pipe. Though I can't imagine that being too effective given this thing would almost certainly be loud when in operation. The boiler would be jointed and have a flexible coupling, so the locomotive would be able to turn effectively on curves, which is a good thought because I can't imagine anything this large, quadra, quinta, or hexa, Getting away with no articulation, that would be impossible, unless they only operated on straight track forever. And pretty much no railway does it that way, there's always a turn or two. Even though there were two boilers, they did use a single firebox. Not sure how well that would have gone, but that's the way it was. And he included a turbine-driven extractor fan that was within the smoke box that was intended to maintain a constant draft through the flues of both boilers. That's because Henderson actually calculated that a conventional blast pipe utilizing steam exhausted from low-pressure cylinders wouldn't have been enough to provide the sufficient draft while the locomotive was in motion. He clearly actually thought this out. So why didn't we get a quadra, quinta, or hexa plex locomotive? Well, that was because of the triplexes, actually. Going bigger was proving to be not wise. They just weren't working effectively. They weren't worth the cost of operation for how frankly, useless they were. Also, remember, this was 1914. Trains were not as long as they are now. There was a very, very, very rare opportunity to require this level of UNWAVERING POWER. And even if there was, it was cheaper just to put a second engine on the front, like a double header or even a triple header. You didn't need this level of technical madness to accomplish that. As interesting as it might have been to actually see them built, they never were. The Pennsylvania Railroad Class V1. Ooh, I'm excited for this one. This is an interesting little topic, as we have a never-built steam turbine locomotive that Pennsylvania Railroad was looking into creating in the 1940s. 
1944, they built the S2, which was their own version of a steam turbine, and actually my personal favorite. Despite not being successful, it's so cool looking. The V1 was supposed to be a different take on that, though, introducing streamlining to the equation, and it was to be built by Westinghouse and Baldwin. It was supposed to be a mechanical drive locomotive, but design's parameters changed multiple times, with a Bose drive between the turbine and the common shafted axles. The boiler was supposed to be a modified Q2, turned around with the grate drop down over the second lead truck. Definitely bizarre, with the boiler turned around, it just looked like it was going backwards. But if you compare it to Chesapeake and Ohio's M1, you see the similarities. I think that's what they were going for here. Baldwin and Westinghouse actually helped build that one as well, later in 1947. So it's likely that they were the ones that were supplying the technical knowledge regarding this interesting look. But it was never built. Why not? Well, it's never been confirmed, but I imagine that's two reasons. A. The S2, I love it to death, just didn't work. Steam turbines aren't efficient at low speeds. High speeds, they're great, but they lose all that cost-effectiveness the second they go slow. The notion of investing in another steam turbine seemed rather silly when the one that they did build, well, didn't work. Plus, it was the 40s, and diesels were rapidly taking over. Steam technology seemed old hat. Why invest a ton of money into a new model steam locomotive when you could just buy a bunch of diesels from EMD? Which is actually what Pennsylvania Railroad wound up doing, as did pretty much every other railway. So sadly, we never got to see what the V1 could have been. Though given the fact it was meant to be a steam turbine, I imagine it would have gone the same way as every other one. Very good at high speeds, and terrible at low speeds. Speaking of EMD, though... The EMD DDR 6,700 horsepower electric locomotive. What in the heck is that thing? Well, this thing is EMD's proposal for an electric locomotive that would have been rather, shall we say, big chungus. This thing has quadra axles. What? Based on the dimensions, there would have been a good reason for that. It would have been very large and very powerful. Like I said, 6,700 horsepower. Sources are pretty scant as to exactly what this was for anyway, but the proposal was apparently for Conrail who must have been in the market for an electric locomotive, but one that was really powerful. So why wasn't it built? I mean, I can think of a few reasons. Other than the fact that it would be ludicrously expensive and heavy, I don't think Conrail had that much electrification on their lines, and that's probably the biggest reason the project fell flat. I mean, they had it, but not enough to warrant this, unless they were going to electrify the vast majority of their network, which would have cost even more money. It definitely seems like finances are probably the main motivator for why we never saw this thing actually built. But personally, even though I'm not exactly sure how well it would have turned out, I would have loved to see it. Because, again, big chungus. The Breitspobop is actually not just referring to a locomotive that wasn't built, but an entire rail network. It was to be a broad gauge railway, and I mean broad. This thing was supposed to be 3,000 millimeters. That's 9 foot, 10 and 1 eighth inches. For reference, global standard gauge is roughly 1,435 millimeters, depending on which country you're in. Soviet gauge is a bit wider than that at 1,524 millimeters. The Breitsperbahn was nearly double Soviet gauge. It would have been huge. But why would it be so big? The proposed locomotive design was no different. Naturally, it would have been very wide to run on such wide rails, but it would have been very tall, much larger than a traditional locomotive. A total of 41 different locomotive designs were actually suggested for this thing, and these ranged from steam turbines to gas turbines to diesel hydraulics to electrics all over the place. After all, it was an entire railway, so of course they could have had multiple different locomotives, but every single one of them would have to be massive, including the cars. It was meant to link the whole of Europe under a single banner, a single regime, to unite a new country. New country? All of Europe? Wait, who was coming up with this? Oh, no. Yep, this was proposed during the Nazi regime in Germany. It would have used double-deck coaches and ran between the major cities of what was to be known as Gross Deutschland, which would have been Adolf Hitler's expanded version of Germany once he conquered the territory he wanted. 
Now, based on that, you probably know why this thing never got off the ground. Simply put, uh, they lost. Thank goodness. They lost the war. The Allies won. And no one wanted to build such a ridiculously massive railway for no reason. Though, admittedly, some did look into it. The Soviets suggested a few things afterwards, but nothing like this ever got off the ground, just due to the expense involved. I mean, these days in some countries, railways are struggling in general. Why would you want a giant one? No one's going to double the gauge of the railway. The notion of such a thing is ludicrous, which might explain the thought process of the people that came up with this. So yeah, that's why we didn't see the Bright Spabon. Atomic Trains! Oh yes, there were multiple proposals and ideas thrown forward for trains that were NUCLEAR POWERED! The mad science on display is magnificent here. One of the earliest proposals for it was in 1954 by Dr. Lyle Borst at the University of Utah. He suggested a 360-ton X-12 locomotive that carried a nuclear reactor fueled by uranium-235. He actually went as far as to contact the Association of American Railroads, as well as numerous railroad companies with the idea. As much like nuclear submarines and boats that are powered by nuclear reactors, a train operating with such a setup would technically be able to operate for months without refueling. This particular design was intended to use urinal sulfate in a water solution instead of solid fuel elements. And it's not impossible. A locomotive is certainly capable of pulling something as heavy as a nuclear reactor has to be, but I think the big issue here was safety. Land-based vehicles utilizing nuclear power is a recipe for something terrible to happen eventually. Trains aren't invulnerable. They do sometimes derail. It's not something that happens every day, but it's often enough for nuclear power to be something of a questionable decision when it comes to this. At least in the sea, ships have a way of isolating their reactors if something goes wrong, safely encased in the hull of the ship as it sinks. Nothing can get in or out, and it's far beneath the ocean. But if a train comes off the rails with a nuclear reactor, well, where's it gonna go? Well, wherever it came off the rails, which could be anywhere from an open field to a major city. It's just not safe at the end of the day. As cool as it might be, the issue of public safety has always held such a project back. Plus, when it comes to trains, why would you want a train that could operate for months without refueling? What purpose does that serve? Trains have to stop and start with regular operation anyway. Half the time they refuel while their cargo's being unloaded. The infrastructure and the method of operation doesn't really account for a locomotive that doesn't stop. I know there's at least one railway that's whole thing is that they never stop, but they still slow down to pick up people, and then it's only a novelty if I'm being honest. Like, why would you really want that in regular operation? Like, those with disabilities would actually rather the, the train stop to pick them up, not, not, not keep going. It's really not actually a great concept, if I'm being completely honest. But Boris wasn't the only one with the idea. Oh no. On the 1st of August, 1952, the Eagle comic featured an artist's impression of what a nuclear-powered locomotive might look like on British railways. Also, major note here, do not let British railways ever attempt a nuclear-powered locomotive. Because, wow, absolutely not, no, 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 no. West Germany in the mid-50s also had an idea proposed by Krauss Maffei that didn't get off the ground because, no. And the Soviets? Oh my goodness, what in the world is that? This enormous thing that may have been based off the Breitspobon would have been a massive cotton trekking train setup, driven by, of course, a nuclear reactor. The artist impression also drew a Deltic diesel locomotive from English Electric for a size comparison. As you can see, it would have been very, very big. That is no longer a train to me. That is an ace combat boss fight, okay? That's what that is. The Soviets were out of control. But again, it never got built because, first of all, no, wow, absolutely, there's no reason for that. But also, again, the safety. The notion of incorporating a nuclear reactor on board a train is always something of a hindrance. British Rail had to crash a locomotive into a nuclear flask to prove they worked because the public was so worried about them. How would they feel about an actual, active, legitimate nuclear reactor on board a train? 
I just don't see it going well. But as recently as 2008, there was another proposition from one William Gregory Taylor for a maglev train that was, yes, meant to be powered by a nuclear reactor. And to be honest, I just can't see this happening. I don't actually have much against nuclear power, as it is pretty clean when it comes to the atmosphere. But I don't think we should put it on a moving platform on land, necessarily. For safety reasons, I think they should absolutely remain stationary in most circumstances. But once again, as usual, the mad science on display has me going. Makes me wanna... <laughs> like that. Happens to me a lot. Sorry. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267 Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoff 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131 232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Dimeblade 17, and Anzac A1. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual Lafond, farewell.